Welcome to the Green Party Live. I'm Jonathan Bartley, co-leader of the Green Party, and once a month we're going to be hosting this series which will gather Greens from around the country, fellow travellers as well, to share their stories on how collaboration, how integration and participation in our democracy hold the key for delivering that urgent system change uh, required to deliver environmental, social and economic justice for all. And today, uh, I'm thrilled and we are very lucky to have Dale Vince. Um, Dale, I met uh, a few years ago when I made a, a trip to Stroud um, to see all he's doing there. Uh, he founded the green energy company Ecotricity in 1996, I think, uh, based on principles of social, financial and environmental sustainability. And before I kick off with the first question, jump into the conversation, just a quick bit of housekeeping. We've got 45 minutes in all and we'll have 15 minutes at the end for questions in the, in the second half of the event. So please put your questions in the Q&A for upvoting and we'll try and get Dale to rattle through an answer as many as we possibly can. And if you've not had the chance to read Dale's book yet, here's the book plug, Holly uh, will pop the link to Dale's book into the chat. Um, please do check it out. So Dale, um, a really, really warm welcome to you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Jonathan. It was a pleasure to be here, actually. And, you know, I was, I was happy to have a chat. These are like the most important issues of our times. So, uh, you know, I'm always happy to chat about them. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, look, take us back to the beginning uh, of your journey. What sparked creation of Ecotricity? I, I spent about 10 years living on the road, um, you know, as a new age traveller living in all kinds of different vehicles. I was trying to find a different way to live, you know, a low impact way to live. Um, and towards the end of that decade, which was the early nineties, um, I was using a small windmill to power my trailer. So I was familiar with wind energy, with renewable energy as a off grid liver. I was kind of familiar with the, um, the, the kind of uh, the, the valuable nature of energy, really. It's, it's kind of preciousness and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And, um, I was living on a hill, parked on a hill outside Strag, which I knew was windy because I used a windmill to power my life. And so I was in tune with my surroundings in that respect. And I just had the idea that uh, I, could, I could do better. I could create more change if I dropped back in for the next however long to try and build a big windmill on that piece of land rather than spend another 10 years perhaps living this uh, personal low impact lifestyle and so it was like an epiphany I just thought you know what I'll do that next I'll drop in I'll try and buy the, build a big windmill on this hill what's that again oh I've lost sound you know what I've done the classic thing I didn't own you <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was my interest. There you go. That's the first time I've done it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, were you an entrepreneur before that? Did you see yourself as an entrepreneur, or do you still? Not really. Oh. I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's a reasonable description. I understand that one. The, the one I object to is business manner, because I think that doesn't describe me at all. Uh, so before that, you know, I was a, I was a traveler. I was a rebel, uh, you know, nonconformist. Uh, a bit of a bit of an inventor I like to make things um, and you know I was I was kind of just looking looking for a way to live I didn't know what I wanted to do um, actually but uh, but I wanted to I wanted to go out and find what there was you know in in the world for me and I kind of had to leave town because it was hard to live in in a town without a job you know the whole system's geared against you you're, you're kind of excluded unless you've got money uh, tied with uh, you know bills rent and and energy bills and stuff like that they they keep you in poverty and and what i didn't want to do was just to be in a um be in the rat race really you know i didn't want a job and a career and and that kind of stuff before i had any idea what i wanted to do with my life i i felt all the while i was at school i was trapped um, and when I left school, I was suddenly free and I was determined not to give that up lightly. It's amazing how many people I've met that had a horrible experience of school and then have just gone on to do amazing things. So that's really encouraging to hear that. Um, and just a small plug for those who are not already Ecotricity customers. Uh, if you're interested in making that switch, uh, Ecotricity have created a very generous relationship with us in that for every person who signs up via our partnership link, um, which Holly, I think, is now going to share in the chat. Ecotricity donates £50 on the sign-up and then £50 for every year you stay with them as your green energy provider. And these funds really help the Green Party 
uh, fund uh, the green future, our campaigns, our policies. Um, so have a think about that. Uh, it might be something you can really do practically to help, help the Green Party. Um, your book there, what, what inspired you to, to, to write the book and what do you want to see happen? What do you want the impact of the book to be? I, th I think the book that uh, was something that kind of just eventually happened, you know, maybe as long as goes 20 years ago, somebody said to me, you should write a book. And I was a bit like, well, you know, that's that's way too early. You know, I haven't done enough yet. And then uh, over the last 20 years, it has popped up every now and then. And it was probably just over a year ago that Penguin popped up and said, you know, we'd like to publish a book that you write. And, and I thought, you know what, this is probably a good time to write one because uh, we've been working for a couple of decades now on the themes of sustainability. We set out to create a new kind of energy, green energy, back in the world, uh, back in the days when you couldn't buy it anywhere in the world, the mid 90s. And then we moved into transport and food because energy, transport and food are the three big issues uh, that we have to tackle to get to zero carbon. And um, having kind of worked in all of these areas and built businesses in these areas to prove that they were kind of viable approaches. Uh, I'd, I'd kind of assembled in my head this uh, this picture of what we needed to do. You know, I think I know what we need to do to get to zero carbon, how we need to, to make the change. And I have a very simple kind of um, world view of things typically, you know, I, I don't, uh, don't tend to present in, in complex ways. And so uh, for me, the book was part biography, I had a story to tell. I've had this journey, I've had fun, I've learned a lot, I had some experiences, but the most important chapter for me is chapter 13 called Manifesto after the book. And that's where I dive into what we need to do in energy, transport and food. And my simple outlook is that we have to do two things. We have to stop burning fossil fuels and stop eating animals. They're driving all of the crises we face, not just the climate crises, but you know, our wildlife extinction, habitat depletion, human health, all that kind of stuff. And they manifest in energy, transport and food, how we power ourselves, how we travel and what we eat. And um, so what I really hope from the, the book is that that chapter itself will will influence people and um, uh, and bring about some change. I'm really interested in the, the food stuff. I, I'm, first, I don't feel it gets enough attention. Um, I'm a vegan, have been for a few years. Uh, and, you know, there's all sorts of stuff coming out about the impact um, that industrial farming has, meat eating has. Mm -hmm. Forest Green Rovers, first vegan football team, uh, as a football fan, I was really pleased to see that. Um, beyond, uh, do you think it's something that needs to happen at the, at the policy level, that the government needs to create the conditions for this change, or do you see that change happening kind of more voluntary from the bottom up, like you've done with Forest Green Road? Yeah, you know, I, I see like three elements of society, really. I see people, businesses, and the government, and we've all got a role to play, and we interact as well and iterate to a degree. And I think there's a rising tide of awareness and concern from people, and uh, you can see that in the decisions people are making, changing their diets, for example, switching to electric cars. Businesses pick those signals up, of course, and they enable that change by making those things available. So the, you know, the increase in uh, plant-based options of the last two or three years has been incredible. And it becomes a great positive uh, feedback effect, like a snowball rolling down a hill. It just just grows bigger because the more these products are available, the more people try them, the more they buy them, and the more demand that businesses feel. And so the more widespread uh, they become available. Um, same with electric cars. I mean, they're taking over the roads. And so people get it. Businesses respond to people. I get that. There's a good interaction between the two. But government have the big levers of power, taxes, subsidies and regulations, and they create the playing field, the economic playing field within which we all work. And at the moment, it's skewed towards the bad things, fossil fuels and animal farming. So what government needs to do is change the regs, change the taxes, take taxes off the good stuff, put them on the bad stuff, and, and actually regulate against the bad way of doing things, you know, because regulations tell us what we can do, can't do, and must not do. And at the moment, they're all kinds of wrong. It's very simple. And I think if government do this, they're only following what people increasingly want to see and enabling businesses to change themselves, which is crucial. You know, business has to change for us to get to zero carbon. Um, so, yeah, that's my analysis of it at the moment. I think government are behind the curve. People and businesses are on board. So you, so you do feel that people and businesses just are waiting just for the, the opportunities to do it? For the, for the right environment? Well, I think you always get <clears throat> early adopters, uh, people and businesses, uh, you know, early adopters in electric cars, plant-based living, whatever it is, renewable energy. Um, and we've seen a growing momentum. So when I formed Ecotricity, there were no um, there was nothing on the grid in terms of modern renewables, the wind and the sun in Britain. Today, we're at 40 odd percent 
uh, which is you know, an enormous achievement. And in 10 years, we could actually get to 100%. We have enough wind and sun to power our country many times over. When we built the Nemesis in 2008, there were no electric cars in the world uh, to buy. And um, just almost 10 years later t today, you know, there's, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand on the roads in Britain, but every major car manufacturer in the world has set a date by which they won't make conventional cars. Even our government have said there's a date by which you can't buy one, which is 2030. So we'll have gone in just 20 years from a place where you couldn't buy an electric car to a place where it's the only kind of car you can buy. That I mean, that is a, that's a transformation in a very short time frame. So if you look at energy, transport and food of the last few years, you know, the rise of veganism, um, it's well underway, I would say. And so we've gone from early adopter stuff. Where we, you know, we've proven that it works economically. It's actually more economic, of course, to use renewable energy, to have electric cars, to eat plant-based food. Because for one thing, we improve our health. You know, we take the poison out of the air, which is killing 40,000 people a year and impacting life quality. We save billions in national health care costs. Uh, and, and same with diet. You know, our diets are killing us. Uh, so the um you know the mess we're in has a really simple route out stop burning fossil fuels stop eating animals and uh it's that it's that easy really for me <laughs> okay, can i push a little bit on this because i mean um the electric vehicles thing i mean it still takes what seven to nine tons of carbon to produce a box which then for a lot, lots of people st sits by the side of the road for 95 percent of the time it's not a very efficient way of doing it you know we still get huge amounts of particulate pollution off the brakes uh, and, and the wheels and the rubber. Um, how much do we need to actually change the way that we move? You know, not just putting in electric vehicles or petrol vehicles, but actually in terms of the public transport system, in terms of the way we work, do we all need, should we be focusing on much more flexible working, trying to get rid of that big commute that everyone makes, uh, what so many people make? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Uh, we absolutely need to change um, how we live, you know, in energy, transport and food. We, we don't just need to source these things sustainably. We need to reduce our consumption of energy, of transport and of food and waste as well, because consumption and waste are different things. So I'm an advocate of that. And I get where you're coming from. You know, we've got like 30 million cars on the road in Britain, which is an obscene number of cars and use of resource. But at the same time, we aren't going to change that overnight. And if we as green people focus on on that instead of changing petrol and diesel cars to electric ones, then we, we miss the, the huge win from electrification, the cleaning up of our air, the running on renewable energy and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean that I don't think that we should have better public transport and people should walk more and cycle more. I definitely do. And, and for that, we need the government and local government to change infrastructure. But what we shouldn't do, sorry, is to is to let perfect be the enemy of good. And taking it aside from policy, where do you feel that, that politics fits into this? Um, I mean, looking ahead, so we've got you know, the climate and ecological emergency. We're saying we should aim for net zero by 2030. It now seems incredibly ambitious to achieve that. Um, it looks like we will overshoot 1.5 degrees um we you know even a change of government at the next general election might not be able to bring about the urgency of the change that we need so i don't want to you know, be despairing <laughs> uh, i want to be hopeful but, you know, where do you see politics you know, the role of politics in all this i think it's um it's the key now to solving this problem i think we have the technology whether you look at renewable energy or um, electrified vehicles uh, in food we don't need technology that's just a simple choice uh, it's more economic to do it this way than to do it the old way we put absurd amounts of subsidies into fossil fuels and fossil fuel cars and planes and factory farming um, so we have the money we have the technology and increasingly people want to see this change happen and of course we have the imperative what we don't have is a government that really gets and just makes the simple changes. You know, we have zero VAT on flying, but 20% on solar panels, you know, 5% on coal, you know, it's, it's cheaper to, to wreck the earth than it is to take care of it. And we only have to change that. And that will enable more and more people to do the right things. So I think government is uh, where we're lacking. We've got technology, we've got economics on our side and people and businesses, of course, respond to what people want. So that's not a problem either. Um, government doesn't get it i'm quite i'm quite optimistic i mean we do need a new government i don't think this government uh, will get it 
Uh, and if they're re-elected, then I think that'll be a bit of a disaster. But I'm optimistic because the pandemic has shown us what we're capable of when we really need to, when we feel we're up against it. You know, we spent 400 billion in just a year fighting the pandemic. That's a whole zero carbon budget for our, for, you know, for our country. And, uh, and we've endured the most incredible uh, changes or restrictions to the way that we live. We don't need that. We need a fraction of that to fight the climate crisis. And so I think the pandemic for me shows us what we're capable of. And we need a fraction of the money and the behavior change uh, to get to zero carbon. So it makes me think, you know, we, we can do this. Well, when you look back at what you've done with Ecotricity, do you feel like you've been on a journey um, or do you think you pretty much ended up where you thought you'd end up in the time you'd end up in? Is there stuff that you, you kind of learn and, and has it been changed since 96? Yeah, I, think, I mean, my life's been a journey and I never had a, an idea where, where I might end up and I still don't actually. And, and when I, you know, started with the idea of building a big, big windmill, it was, um, it was pretty ambitious. You know, it was a guy living in a trailer on a hill with no money or, or training or, or knowledge of the sector. In, and it was a new sector. Um, modern wind energy was just getting started. Um, and I didn't have a vision beyond one windmill. And uh, so, you know, life is a journey. I've learned an awful lot on the way. I learned, you know, first off, I, I dived into this because energy was the biggest single source of carbon emissions in Britain. So then I went looking for second and third in the early 2000s because that was logical. Found energy, transport and food, 80% of everybody's personal carbon footprint, which I think is a really um, great and simplified message because too often we're overwhelmed by the scale of the problem and and our own kind of you know potential to change that when actually i think that we have a, a much greater agency in this than we realize because every day we choose where we spend our money uh, on powering our homes on traveling and and eating and if we if we make a different choice we get a different outcome so i don't know where i'm heading um i don't think anybody ever really does they might they might plan for it but i don't think anybody can know where they're heading and uh, and that's part of the fun, I think. Okay, so but where next for ecotricity? Is it just more of the same, or have you got plans for ecotricity? No, we 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 try to be where we can have the most impact, you know. Um, so green green energy was an innovation from us in the mid '90s. Um, if you look around now, everybody's doing it. Uh, all over the world it's a thing you know it's quite common uh, wind and solar projects are, are taking over grids uh, around the world which is fab so there's not a lot of heavy lifting we need to do in in that sphere we dived into transport when there were no electric cars on the road that's happening now big time uh, we built an electric charging network because there were none and that was holding us up that's happening now as well there must be a dozen networks in britain now so we're not needed in that space either we've been pushing for uh, plant-based living and stuff like that and i think that's coming so we've opened some new frontiers with our diamonds made from uh, atmospheric carbon, sky diamonds. I think that's interesting. We've got a water device in R&D. Uh, we're just about to build some battery projects and develop a smart grid uh, outcome with that, harnessing business demand with, with batteries and renewable energy. I think that's really important because how we get to 100% renewable energy on the grid is is key and, and it's with a smart grid and technology. So we're we're at that frontier um, and that we like to be at the frontier of things because we can have the best impact there because we're not driven by shareholders uh, and the need to make money for shareholders. We just do the things that we think are important. So we tend to be there first uh, b before there's a business case. Now, the, the questions are, are racking up in the Q&A and... <laughs> There's some interesting ones coming in, so I'd quite like to move to them. Is that okay? Um, Absolutely. I mean, this yeah. is a fascinating one that's been uploaded, so you might not want to comment on this, but um, I, will, I will rephrase it slightly. But has the, do you felt like the establishment has worked, I don't know what you mean by the establishment, maybe political establishment has worked to undermine your vision? Uh, and if so, how did you counteract them? Have you felt you faced blocks that you had to kind of overcome? Or has it been pretty easy to get where you wanted to go uh there, it's been a series of battles um but i'm i'm built for that I, i've got a kind of uh i've got a makeup that um that sees me impervious to resistance and obstacles and and that kind of stuff so if i've decided uh, on a direction and then for me it's about sustainability uh, you know that that's what drives me fundamentally the the need for that now i say it's been a series of battles i don't think there's a system or a systematic attempt to undermine uh, me or this mission. I just think that um, what I've been trying to bring is change. 
and people and institutions resist change. And, and of course, there's greed out there in the world. I bumped into that. There's dishonesty and deceit. I bumped into that. And you have to deal with that as well. But I don't think there's a systematic uh, attempt to undermine. I think our current government, for example, just doesn't get it. You know, they just, we're, we're going into politics here. I know we weren't going to, but, no, you, know, <laughs> they, they, you know, they, they just want to tick boxes and say, look, we're green. We've got a 10 point plan, whatever. Do you know what I mean? And, and then they do all the stupid things like stand by while a, a new coal mine gets opened, a third runway, biggest gas fired power station in, in Europe. And, and then talk about slashing um, f tax on domestic flights. I mean, you know, I mean, our government couldn't, couldn't do things that are more opposite to what they say they uh, uh, are going to do on the climate. So that's a fundamental problem. But I think that's just cheap politics from them. So that leads nicely onto the next question from Philippa. I should say that last question was from, uh, from George Onshi. Um, Philippa says, how are we going to change this government's approach to onshore wind? Um, obviously, we've seen massive price drops in offshore wind. Um, but there's murmurings of support, Philippa says onshore but i don't know if it's any more onshore turbines are going to get planning permission what, what's your view on that yeah it was something that david cameron shut down the onshore wind industry along with the solar industry as well uh, actually but uh, it was more egregious for the wind industry because he did it through planning he made it impossible to get planning and onshore wind has always been massively popular in our country every opinion poll ever undertaken in the last 25 years shows something like 70% support. And these are opinion polls taken by the government, universities, opponents of wind, supporters of wind, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter when you take them or where, that's what you get. So it was completely dishonest of Cameron to say he was shutting down onshore wind because people didn't want it. Uh, and local people should have a choice at the same time. Of course, he was, he was forcing fracking on us. He was taking the planning decision out of the hands of local councils, escalating up to county councils. It was changing planning law, uh, environment protections to force fracking through when opposition to fracking stood at exactly the same level as the support for wind energy, about 70%. So, you know, it was, it was BS from our government actually to do this. We need onshore to come back. I think it's a big role to play, but it won't happen under this government, I don't believe. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, have you seen Sea Seaspiracy? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm well, producer of the thing. film. What, what do you think? And, and how do we tackle commercial fishing? Yeah, I'm an exec producer of Sea Spiracy, so oh, I, I spoke. Project. Yeah. No, no, no biggie. I spoke to the guys uh, about four years ago. They wanted to make a film, uh, a kind of ocean version of Cowspiracy. And uh, I've been working with Sea Shepherd for a decade or so as well. So I kind of had a, um, a concern and a, and a good understanding of, of what's happening out in the oceans, but not as good as I have now. And you know, for me, it's just a seaborne version of, of the destruction that we're wreaking on shore through diet choice, you know, which is about intensive animal farming out in the sea. There's some farming, but mostly it's just the kind of destruction of nature hoovering up sea life, you know, um, it's, it's just an incredible thing. Um, the film itself has, has reached a huge audience and seems to have had a really big impact. There are so many people uh, that I hear about saying, I'll never eat fish again. <laughs> I've seen that film, it's awful. And, and I think that's fantastic. You know, I like that because a lot of people think that um, they can see that meat is bad. That's, uh, you know, that's becoming fairly widespread in terms of its understanding. And they say, well, I'll eat fish instead because that's better, isn't it? You know, and it might be because they think fish are less important as a species. Maybe they have less feelings or something like that. Or they think it's less unhealthy than meat. But this film gives you a different view. OK, we've got a question about um, what, what someone has termed a monopoly on EV charging points that you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you happy to take one? I'm going to give it to you anyway, because I think yeah, give it to you hold you to account. I think it's an interesting um, uh, question, actually. But anyway, uh, the allegation is you've got a monopoly on EV charging points along most ways. Um, some of them are often not working, um, uh, and none of them works for our, our Hyundai Kona. Um, we phoned about this, uh, and we've been told it's Hyundai's fault. Um, you say Hyundai says it's Ecotricity's fault. Uh, are you aware of this yeah. issue? I'm, I'm not being yeah, totally uh, up totally. on electric vehicles. I don't know. So yeah. Yeah, no, listen, I'm totally all over it. Um, a number of people have said over the last few years that we have a monopoly. We don't. Um, that's a matter of fact. Um, that our pumps are unreliable uh, to a degree that's true no doubt about that we have had problems and uh, there are problems with new models of car so every time a manufacturer brings a new model out we we have bumped into um, 
like handshake problems, I would say, the communication between the pump and the car. And quite often it is a car side problem. Sometimes it's a pump side problem, but there's a, the, the new standard CCS is a European standard for charging. And it appears that it's not being implemented equally on both sides, pumps and cars. We usually get over the problems. So, you know, we had problems with JAG, you know, maybe 12 months ago, we seem to be over those now. Um, and that's by working with the manufacturers to iron them out. But it's also worth pointing out that we started building our network in 2011, when there were like a handful of cars on the road and charging was at seven kilowatts. There was no Chardamo, there was no CCS. You know, uh, these are the faster charging standards. They didn't exist. And so our tech is the oldest uh, on the roads of Britain, for sure. It was before contactless as well. Within 18 months, we were at 50 kilowatts. Today, we're building 150 and 350 kilowatts, which is, in 10 years, incredible to come from seven kilowatts. So we need to replace all of our pumps to make them modern, contactless, and, and more reliable. We're doing that now. The first 50 will be replaced by the end of May, and by early summer, we'll have replaced the whole fleet with, with modern stuff. So uh, my main message is, you, you know, we know it's not perfect. It's, it's a long way from perfect, but that it's become old. It's become outdated, and we're changing the whole thing. How interesting is a question for me. How, what's the carbon impact of having to upgrade and renew and scrap and replace all the time on such a scale when technology is improving so rapidly? But, I mean, it's not ideal. Um, and there's been a kind of VHS beta max thing going on on charging standards. Chardemo is a Japanese standard. Nissan Leaf were first movers in the UK and European market. And so we built a whole bunch of uh, Chardemo charges with them. Then CCS came out and we got the manufacturers to add CCS to our pumps, which is probably where some of our problems come from. You know, they weren't designed and built from scratch to be CCS. And of course, there's a third standard as well, AC. So, you know, you have a situation where you see one of our pumps on a motorway and it's got three three heads and uh, you choose which one you want to use you know it's far from ideal it's not what we're used to as people of course we drive into a garage and you really you choose petrol or diesel don't you and uh, and fill it up um so it's not ideal to be replacing tech all the while but you've got to look at the the upside you know the idea that in 10 years time you can't buy a polluting car you know a conventional polluting car is amazing and if on the way we've had to burn through some uh, technology and replace hardware i think that's a big deal okay i've got a couple of questions here i'm going to take together from max and bernard about um types of generating uh power what are your thoughts first on biomass to generate power? Um, to be avoided. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not green, is it? You know, it, it needs to be avoided. Uh, I mean, Drax has been, um, you know, uh, converting their, uh, their gas-fired uh, station to, to, to uh, biomass incrementally. <clears throat> and they're burning massive amounts of wood pellets at the moment that are shipped across from Canada and the US. And... Um, is presented as green, presented as carbon neutral, but look, it's still burning something, you know, and we need to stop that. Great, and there was another question which seems to have disappeared, uh, but I'm quite keen to ask it about um, tidal and wave. And I, I went to see uh, in, in Wales possible tidal lagoons, and it, it seemed like a very effective way of you know, having that ability just to release the energy when you needed it, at the point when you needed it. <clears throat> Are you moving into that area at all? Yeah, we've had a, uh, a wave device in R&D for a while. It's, it's not been possible to kind of bring it to a point where it's economic to make it's something called the sea razor. So we, we haven't been active in that for a few years, but we are active in tidal lagoons. Um, and, and we, you know, we'd like to build a project, the offshore version, though not the onshore, I should say, because when they're connected to the shore, uh, you create inherent problems of cost and, and uh, other kinds of impact. Uh, but the offshore version, I think, is quite brilliant. And I think, you know, we could have like, let's say 10% of our energy nationally that way. And it would form part of this smart grid because the tides are, are very predictable. And there's an element of storage there. You can hold the water back for a little while and then choose when you use it. I think it, it could be, well, it's like a battery, uh, quite frankly. It's a form of renewable energy and storage combined. And it has, I think, a really great role to play. That's great. Um, question from Penelope. Uh, your business model embraces collaborative ethical business practice. Do you have any ideas or resources for new businesses trying for sustainable ethical business practice? She says she's just starting out. Most good business practice models she's trying to learn from don't align with the ideals that she wants to foster. 
Yeah, I don't actually, we don't have anything. I never tried to learn from big business or, or any kind of business. When I, when I did this, I just uh, followed my principles, uh, you know, which is to be open and transparent and fair to everybody. These are the principles that we've embedded in Ecotricity. We're mission led, so we're not here to pursue money. And uh, I think that's one of the most important principles you can have, because when you pursue money, you'll just make the wrong decisions, bad decisions for the environment and for the people around you. And I think it's a matter of simple principles, you know, be good to everybody, be honest, be, be fair, be trustworthy and, uh, and uh, you know, treat other people the way you want to be treated yourself. Those are my business principles. They're my life principles. Uh, do you do any kind of incubation of, of projects uh, like, a, like a dragon den, get people to come in and support? <laughs> That's <laughs> fun. No, I was funny. <laughs> it's funny you should say that because um you know we're always being approached by people with ideas and and occasionally we have picked up ideas and, and worked with people on them um, most recently would have been the devil's kitchen which is our, our vegan school dinner um outfit and we've just been kicking around uh, for a while now the idea of setting up our own kind of green dragons den uh, shooting some videos sticking it up on social media you know just to kind of film ourselves in some of these situations with people that come in with business ideas and and how we go about it you know i've seen dragons den i think the focus on money is is just quite revolting frankly and the way those people try to make something of those uh, people with ideas and, and new businesses, uh, you know, my approach would be to help people if the business is going to bring some sustainability. Fantastic. Okay, we have a question from Khan Ross, who's, I know, personally, is a former diplomat, active in the party. Um, he'd be keen, and we did gloss over this, so apologies for that, keen to hear more about how you could just went from one windmill to a major energy uh, provider. How did that journey happen? I think it just took 20 years, an awful lot of persistence, uh, a number of battles, a great deal of luck, I would say. But then I think you make your own luck with persistence and, and doggedness, uh, which I have in abundance, which is fortunate for me. And organic growth. So, you know, we haven't been uh, paying shareholders. We're not set up that way. So the money we make, we put back into our business. I think that's probably been an advantage for us. We've also um, pursued... Uh, vertical integration, not not from a point of kind of theory, but because it, it just makes great sense. If something's important, I've found uh, in life and, and in business, let's say, uh, then you should do it yourself uh, because you have control of it in terms of timing and quality, but you also keep the margin inside your company as well. So we've been end to end as an energy company. You know, we've gone out and we found sites for wind farms, <clears throat> Uh, and we've taken them through planning ourselves. It really mirrors my journey to build the first windmill. We've done our own wind resource assessment. We even built our own towers to measure the wind. Um, and then we've built our own business plan. We've built our own windmills. I mean, literally constructed them, not, not manufactured. And, uh, and then we own and operate them. We maintain them ourselves. We take the electricity and we sell it ourselves. We do our own billing, our own customer service. You know, we're the most end-to-end -end energy company probably ever. And that I think has been one of our great advantages. You strike me as someone that doesn't let anyone stand in your way. <laughs> is that a fair characterization? I mean, you, you get something and you just go for it and you just say, we're going to make this happen. Is that, yeah. it's always been like that, if that's the case. I think it's in my nature. Yeah. I mean, I discovered a couple of years ago that I have Asperger's and I think, you know, it's, so it's a neurological thing. It's how I'm wired. If something's important to me, then I won't let somebody tell me I can't do it. And in fact, that's a little bit of a red rag sometimes, uh, but it certainly doesn't put me off. And, you know, I'm just going to get on and, and do the things that I think are important. That's how I am. Great. Um, Anne has asked, uh, what state of play is with your legal challenge on energy policy? Yeah, it's kind of um, the government have accepted now that they they need to uh, review uh, the MPSs, um, and we're we're kind of waiting on them to do that now. And we've taken the I same can you argument elaborate for those that might not be familiar uh, with the context and MPS and abbreviations. That would just be helpful. For yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think it's national planning statement or something like that. I don't know exactly what it stands for, but it, it is the national kind of policy framework and uh, it exists in energy, for example. So that's where our, our primary challenge was in energy to say that, look, um, since this planning uh, framework was put in place about 10 years ago, a lot has happened in the world. We've had Paris in 2015. And of course, we've become uh, legally obliged to become a zero carbon country by 2050. And 
that policy was written before that and so it's out of date it's a policy for example that is in favor of fossil fuels you know um by default which, which can't make any sense so it would seem obvious but we spent i don't know maybe nearly 12 months saying to the government you have, you have to change this policy and and within uh, within the regulations, the government are actually obliged to review policy to make sure that it's up to date, but they refused for so many months, we had to seek a judicial review and that kind of stuff, but they've accepted it now. Um, so now we're waiting for the review itself to take place. It shouldn't be difficult, should it, to say, actually, we need to, uh, you know, prejudice against fossil fuels and for renewable energy. But, you know, this is a government that um, doesn't do what it, uh, what it says it's going to do. So we've taken the same arguments uh, into uh, aviation as well to oppose uh, airfield expansion. Uh, as, uh, some other people are taking the same arguments into the road building program. Basically to say, you know, everything that the government is doing in terms of infrastructure and planning is out of date, you know, it's, and, and it needs modernizing so that it reflects our climate uh, requirements, not just targets and ambitions, but requirements. So it's about using the law to call the government to account. I feel like uh, we're covering a hell of a lot of ground there. We've got 10 minutes left. Thank you so much for being so succinct. Um, fascinating question here. Uh, which has just gone up my screen, so I can't see it. <laughs> okay. um, regarding <laughs> raising awareness of the need um, for electric electrification of vehicles, what are your thoughts on motorsports formulas like uh, Extreme E or Formula E? What role could they play in shifting public attitudes, if any? Yeah, you know, I think all sports has a role to play. So obviously we we run Forest Green Rovers and we've found that to be an incredible platform to talk about sustainability to a new audience. And I'm really big on talking to new audiences. Like the last couple of months, we've been working with the Daily Express, for example, with the Green Britain campaign, because we're trying to reach, a, let's call it a more right-wing audience uh, and get them on board because we need to. So um, Extreme E, I really like the concept. They offered us a team in, in the series, but we couldn't afford it. But I love the car. I would really love to have one of those cars. They look fabulous. And they put a lot of thought into it. Um, the cars are going to be sailed around the world from venue to venue instead of flown and that kind of stuff. So um, I, I think sport in that in that shape can can influence people. It will do absolutely uh, extremely formula -y. Uh, But football, the way we play it, that influences people as well. It has a big role because people look up to sport and supporting icons and they take steers from them in terms of how to live their lives. And it's essentially just a platform for communication to me. You, you mentioned the Express. I'd love to ask you more about how much you think it's changed because there was a, a really surprising editorial the other day and I gather that you had something to do with it and it's all falling into place now. Um, how much of a, a change do you think there has been at the Express? I, I sense a really big one. So... You know, we've been working a couple of months and talking for a couple of months before that. It's turning into a year-long campaign leading up to COP. And the editorial team there have been really, uh, I think, impressed and pleased and encouraged by the reaction they've had from their readership uh, and from the government, actually, because they're, they're connected to the government in ways that we're not. They're definitely listening. And I think... You know, when the government gets this message in its left ear, let's say, from us, that's one thing. But when it gets it in its right ear from their own audience, I think it's a different thing. And I've been really encouraged as well. You know, I've had people email me, um, express readers. I've done a lot of talk radio as well lately with, uh, you know, some right wing people like Mike Graham, uh, for example, whom I've, I've struck up a friendship with. And, you know, he's given me time to talk about the issues and and. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's gone semi-vegan. He saw sea spirits and it's bothered him. You know, he said, I'm not giving up fish yet, but I'm kind of on the journey. And, and for me, it's the most important thing that we get out of our bubbles and we talk to other people because we've got to bring everybody together to make the changes that we need to make. It can't be a left-right thing. And, you know, I first learned about that in football, um, talking to a new audience of people. And so, yeah, this is, uh, for me, a fundamental and exciting thing to be doing. Great. Um, five minutes to go. Um, hi Vince, I'm a volunteer with Humane Being. Thanks for being an ambassador for the organisation's Scrap Factory Farming campaign. If the legal challenge wins, do you think the current government will make any change? You might want to elaborate a little bit on what the legal challenge is. Um, I, I, I don't actually recall the detail of it. It sounds like a, a legal challenge to factory farming. Um, it certainly needs to be done. Um, I, I think this government will make the changes that they have to make, not more. Uh, unfortunately. Great. Uh, Chris Millman, do you have any plans to put on sustainable shared 
match day transport uh, from local. Oh, it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> it moved while I was speaking. Uh, uh, from local population centres. It's moved again. <laughs> Stop it. Um, oh, where, where's it gone? Hold on. It's moved as I'm reading it out. I think it was about local match day transport from local population centres to Forest Green Rovers. Um, uh, there's disappointment um, among a, a big market amongst disappointed former Bristol Rovers supporters. There you go. A new market to move into <laughs> Forest Green Rovers. Yeah. <laughs> you got there in yeah, the end. That's yeah, no, got, gotcha. Look, yeah, our current location at Forest Green Rovers is really difficult to get to. And we do have a park and ride, but it is with conventional buses. But that's about all we have access to at the moment. I think there might be a dozen electric buses on the roads of Britain now. There are hundreds of thousands in China. So that big change is coming. They make them there. Um, for our new location, Eco Park, it's on junction 13 of the M5. It's going to be very accessible, particularly from Bristol, from Birmingham, and from Stroud. We will put on electric buses absolutely uh, by then. We're only talking, I hope, maybe four years. Electric buses will be more common by then. We'll put them on ourselves for sure. And we're providing other ways to get there, like cycle and footpaths and stuff like that as well. Um, but yeah, um, sustainable. Sustainable travel to football is is an issue and it comes up all of the time and, and it's often held up as one of those kind of, you know, what, what about issues, you know, what if we can't deal with this kind of stuff and, you know, my answer, I'm just going to share this is look, we shouldn't sweat the stuff that we can't fix right now. There's plenty else to be getting on with. And in the background, of course, electric car, uh, sorry, cars are being electrified, buses are being electrified, even planes are being electrified. 10 years from now, you'll be able to fly across Europe in an electric plane. So we can't sort that out today. We shouldn't let it get in our way of doing what we can do today, which is a great deal. Um, Robbie is asking, what, what's the background flag about? Um, yellow and black union flag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually uh, meant to be green, but is, it is a, is a shade of yellow that I get that. It's, um, it's our flag, the Green Union Jack. We've probably been using it for maybe 15 years. Uh, back in the days of the London Olympics, EDF, a French nuclear company, pinched it and stuck it on their vans, which was outrageous. I mean, they were French on the one hand, not, not British, and they were nuclear, not, not renewable. And... Um, we had to sue them to get it back. And more recently, our own government pinched it to use it for something they called Green Britain Week. And um, we had to sue them to get it back as well. It's a funny old thing. But we shared it with the Daily Express. They use it. We're always happy to share. It's just when people take it and, and use it for the wrong purpose. We didn't want to be associated with a, uh, you know, um, a lame government Green Britain Week, for example, or a French nuclear company. Um, but uh, our Green Britain campaign with the Express works for us. This symbolizes all of our work in energy, transport and food and making room for nature. We're trying to uh, green up the country that we live in. Yeah, I think we've run out of time. I'm really, really sorry. Um, I would love to come and chat. I just got this uh, sense from you today about how much you're involved in. Uh, and it's really, really exciting. Thank you. Apologies mm -hmm. to those questions we, we didn't get to. Um, if you're interested in buying Dale's book, Holly's going to pop the link to our green shop in the chat where you can get it. Um, if you're interested in making the switch to ecotricity, and I will also support in the party, you can click the link that Holly is sharing in the chat any second now. Um, a huge, huge thanks to you, Dale. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do in the future. I hope maybe you'll come back in uh, not, not too long, hence, uh, to kind of update us on what you're doing. It seems like you're doing things all the time. But our next event uh, will be with Caroline Lucas uh, discussing the climate uh, and ecological emergency, the CCE with e uh, And we're going to pop a link in the chat now where you can RSVP. Um, thank you so much, Dale, uh, for taking the time to come and share your work and your book with us and all that you're doing. Um, and we'll see everyone next time. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody, for listening in and sending questions. Thank you. Take care, everybody.